Welcome to Emerging Topics in Catholic Healthcare Ethics, Session 10, End of Life Decision Making in the Intensive Care Unit, a live webcast presented by the Catholic Health Association and Georgetown University. Uh, I am Brian Kane. I am the Senior Director for Ethics for the Catholic Health Association, and I will be the moderator for this session. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this 10th webinar in the series Emerging Topics in Catholic Healthcare Ethics. In our ongoing commitment to provide timely, relevant information about emerging issues for Catholic healthcare, the Catholic Health Association is offering this monthly web series of webinars to address critical ethical issues in caring for patients and families in Catholic hospitals, long-term care facilities, and medical centers nationwide. This series is offered in partnership with Georgetown University, Loyola University of Chicago, and St. Louis University. Before I introduce today's speaker, let us pause and take a moment to reflect uh, on this most holy of weeks. There is perhaps no other part of the human body as humble as our feet. They are literally at the bottom of everything we identify as our physical self. Our feet are our connection with the soil of the earth and carry us through our life's journey. To touch the feet of another is an intimate gesture in many cultures. In our culture, we entrust such touch to those who love us most. In Jesus' day, Walking was the usual means of transportation. Because feet were only partially covered, foot washing was a frequent need. It served as both a gesture of hospitality in domestic settings and as a means of ritual purification before entering both domestic and sacred spaces. Those who performed the actual foot washing were at the bottom of the social hierarchy. How significant is it that Jesus voluntarily takes up this lowest of tasks at the Last Supper with his disciples. This act and its meaning could not have been clearer or more shocking to them, so much so that Peter refused at first to allow the Lord to debase himself in this way. All the themes of our Lenten retreat are powerfully captured in our imitation of Jesus' foot washing during our worship on Holy Thursday. This act expresses all that preceded this moment for Jesus and all that follows, his utter self-emptying on the cross of Good Friday and the vindication of that offering in his Easter resurrection. In earliest Christianity, the foot washing by Jesus was so significant that this scripture was proclaimed during the baptism of new Christians. It made clear that through baptism, new disciples are called to serve this broken world so beloved by God. If we need one image which captures the soul of Jesus' mission and ours, it is that of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. All else was elaboration and consummation of what he had given away that holy Thursday night. We plumb the depths of this self-giving every day in the Ministry of Catholic Healthcare. Our calling is to serve others in their brokenness. Our touching, tending, washing of those who are in our care is a manifestation of the same humble compassion that God has shown us in Christ. Each day, we are privileged to live out this mystery of self-emptying love, which, by God's grace, helps to make those we serve more whole. Along the way, we ourselves rediscover our own brokenness and God's humble, healing touch.
Pray with me. Self-giving God, your love for us and the world you have made surpasses anything we can imagine. Again and again you have knelt before us and ministered to us in our need. Never let us forget such love, dear Lord. Give us new passion to share this same love in humble service to all those you send to us in their time of need. For the great privilege of this healthcare ministry, we give you all thanks and praise. Amen. We are very honored to be joined again today by Dr. Alan Roberts, Professor of Clinical Medicine at Georgetown University Medical Center. Dr. Roberts is Professor of Clinical Medicine, Associate Medical Director for the hospital, Medical Director of the Surgical Intensive Care Unit, and Chair of the Clinical Ethics Committee at Georgetown University Medical Center. Dr. Roberts has been extensively involved in postgraduate medical education, specifically resident education and critical care. He has a keen interest in end-of-life care of ethics and transplantation ethics. He's been active in local activities in opposition to physician-assisted suicide, testifying before the D.C. City Council in July 2015 against the proposed physician-assisted suicide bill. As a reminder, if you have questions, please enter them in the Q&A module. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Roberts to begin the discussion. Welcome, Dr. Roberts. Well, thank you, um, Dr. Kane, and uh, boy, what an honor it is to be uh, speaking with this group today. Thank you for inviting me. And, um, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate as, as an Anglican, a, a junior varsity uh, Catholic, I do appreciate the, the meditation very much so very moving. Um, I'm going to, um, to read a brief passage from the Psalms here, uh, and I think it will be applicable um, as we uh, think through some of the things we'll talk about in the intensive care unit. This is from Psalm 18. The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of chaos overwhelmed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. I cried to my God for help from his temple. He heard my voice and my cry for help reached his ears. So appropriate uh, to, to pause on uh, this psalm for a moment, which uh, uh, King David uh, in the spirit gave, himself gave prophetic voice to the Lord himself as this psalm looks forward and anticipates uh, Christ's own suffering uh, this week, which we set aside to remember. Um, uh, so thank you all very much. I'm looking for the advance button here for my slides. So I need some tech support. There we go, thank you. So today I'm gonna to talk about um, uh, end of life decision-making in the intensive care unit. And um, button, yeah, okay. And uh, now mine is the perspective of a long time critical care doc. Uh, my, I first walked into an intensive care unit as a medical student almost 40 years ago to the, to the day. Um, and I've never looked back. Uh, my father was, was a general practitioner for many years. Uh, I wanted to be just like him. Uh, and my pathway in medicine has uh, been pretty much different from general practice, but I do hope to bring a little bit of the general practitioner into the intensive care unit when I, when I go in. Um, I've been doing a serious amount of, uh, of uh, reflection on things theological for these 40 years, uh, and more recently have uh, have entered the, the study and discipline of, of bioethics and specifically as they apply to end of life care. Uh, and as was mentioned, you know, we fought the good fight over assisted suicide in DC some years ago. Uh, we lost that fight, um, but uh, the fight still goes on in other jurisdictions around the country and we just uh, won a major vic victory in uh, the state of Connecticut. Um, I, I'm still learning critical care and I'm still learning 
how to do ethics. Now, this here is a quote from uh, the, the late Richard Selzer, uh, who is, who, uh, whose short stories I commend to you, notes on the art of surgery. Dr. Selzer, very much tongue in cheek, uh, opines uh, that one day uh, people will look back on, uh, on the day when physicians like giants walked uh, the earth. Uh, he was, uh, his initial quote referred to surgeons uh, rather than physicians. Uh, he was a surgeon and uh, we know and love plenty of surgeons. So we get this quote, but I'm gonna come back a little bit later and say that this uh, passage, this quote from this short story is in some ways prophetic. And I'll tell you why as we go forward. So as in all things medicine, we start with a case study and then we will move on with uh, lessons to be learned. This is a fictitious case, although anybody who's been in uh, medicine or ethics will, will recognize this person and the situation, even though it's fictitious, she's fictitious. An 80 year old uh, patient is admitted to the intensive care unit with septic shock secondary to severe community acquired pneumonia. After an initial period of stabilization, she develops progressively downhill course uh, she goes back on the ventilator. Uh, ventilator settings are going up. Um, she has, uh, we, we're putting on pressors, which are medications that support her blood pressure, which is pathologically low. Her kidneys have failed. And so we embark on a course of continuous uh, dialysis for her. Well, she's not healthy on a good day before the intensive care unit. She had severe COPD diabetes, coronary disease, and she has new evidence of a, a fresh heart attack on EKG. Now, despite all appropriate antibiotics and interventions and procedures, she continues to lose ground. We've updated her family regularly uh, since she's been in the hospital here, I'll say for three weeks. But anybody who does critical care, nursing, uh, physicians, uh, uh, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, everybody's going to recognize that this patient cannot survive. And so we embark on what we call a goals of care meeting with the family. What to do next? Now, the context, this is not a problem that my uh, dad would have come across in his early days in medicine. This uh, situation is, is not a uh, it's unique to intensive care units, uh, life support and what to do with life support when someone is, is not getting better. Uh, that is a relatively new phenomenon in medicine. The context is, of course, that uh, if you step back and that there is the old Victorian house that my dad was born in, in 1903, most of us hope to, uh, to die at home. Uh, however, only, you know, 20% uh, of us in America die at home. This is from a palliative care website at, uh, at Stanford, this data. I double checked it again yesterday, it's, uh, it still holds. 60% um, uh, of patients uh, of Americans die in acute care hospitals, 20% uh, die in nursing homes, and only 20% of us will end up dying uh, in that home. And I always like to think of home as home, even if the love we've had at home has uh, been imperfect, it is nonetheless home. We wanna be there. I wanna be there. I wanna have my golden retriever and my family and a cold beer. Now, the good news is if you wind up in the intensive care unit, uh, the, the vast majority of patients in the intensive care unit do survive. Um, 22% of deaths in the intensive care unit follow a period of time, either during or follow, uh, following a, a period of time in the intensive care unit. And of those patients who uh, do pass away in the intensive care unit, uh, as many as 90% of those deaths occur following a decision to either limit or withdraw life support. Now, this, uh, this is from an old uh, slide that I have not updated. We never withdraw care. We only withdraw artificial life support when it is no longer uh, deemed to be appropriate. So this, this uh, slide is, is misstated. Intensive care admission uh, is really a therapeutic trial. Um, 
you know, we might have been able to take a look at this patient ahead of time, and we could probably predict that given her comorbidities, it's a term we've all been, <clears throat> been made familiar with by virtue of COVID, her, um, her age and her multi-system failure, we have a pretty good idea that she's not going to survive. But you know what? We're going to give it a good faith effort. And, um, and so her intensive care admission is a, uh, embarking on a therapeutic trial. Now, of course, the problem we get into is that the patient who, upon who, uh, I'm having trouble with the slides here. We embark on the trial. It appears as in this patient that the, the trial is uh, not going to be successful. And consequently, as we go forward and in daily conversation with the patient's family, of course, she's on the ventilator and being given sedation, unable to participate in the, the conversations. Um, we move from a, what we call a therapeutic intent uh, to a palliative uh, intent. We, we move from cure to comfort as our uh, goal. Now, I use this quote here, this transition, of course, is very difficult. It, it is um, in many ways more difficult to, to change course uh, for both physicians and nurses and families and in the intensive care unit than perhaps to have foregone a lot of life support in someone that we might've predicted would not survive. However, we find ourselves in this situation and this transition is difficult because, uh, uh, and this is a quote from a consensus statement from the Society of Critical Care Medicine some years ago, that there's a widespread and deep desire not to be dead. Well, no kidding. They really needed a consensus statement to come up with that, but it is truth. And, um, uh, and, uh, and consequently, we begin the, the difficult task of working with the, the families and the surrogate decision makers to get to the right set of decisions. Well, of course, that psalm I read, the cords of death, the torrents of destruction, that sounds in many ways like the intensive care unit. There's, there's IV lines, there's electrical cords, there's fluids running wide open. And so this is the, the uh, scenario. Somewhere in there is the patient upon whom we, um, uh, we are to be all about. And of course, the beauty of Georgetown, as in any Catholic hospital, I think, is that in the middle of all this, uh, we have a crucifix in every room to remind us of, of who also is present with us in this time, this most weighted of hours. This is from that same consensus statement, and this gives us a, a sort of a graphic depiction of how we move from the time of uh, the presentation and initial diagnosis of a patient who is critically ill. We embark with, uh, on the whole thing with a curative intent, and over time, as it appears that the patient is uh, not going to do well. We begin the process of uh, orienting the family, reorienting the family and ourselves and our colleagues to, uh, to a more palliative intent. Uh, and this also indicates the, the various uh, personnel who are involved along the way, personnel, naturally family and, and the, the patient, of course, um, other caregivers. And one of the, the most important things that, ha that has happened in critical care in the last dozen years is the advent of uh, palliative care into the intensive care unit. We uh, have always thought as intensive care doctors, we do a pretty good job of taking care of patients at the end of life, managing their, um, uh, their symptoms, uh, working with families. Um, but, uh, to, but having the, the palliative care presence as we've got here at Georgetown in the last uh, five or six years in a very robust way has, uh, has been a real important augmentation of our ability to care for these unfortunate ones. Uh, one of the things that hospice care does well, which critical care doctors are still learning how to do is the, uh, the bereavement care following uh, the death of the patient. Now, a couple of things about the ICU. Um, I call this the unifying character of all ICUs, uh, that many patients, uh, this one, for example, have a high likelihood of death, despite everything 
possible being done and done correctly and according to you know standard of care state of the art uh, and we re, we understand from the the physician and, and medical team side we understand that the care provided in the icu is predominantly supportive uh, it's a bridge to um to a recovery either to a prior state of health return to a prior state of better health or to a definitive treatment such as maybe a liver transplantation for someone who's in with liver failure the problem is for this patient in particular there's not a good state of health to return to she's in horrible health on a good day um, moreover it may be that there is no definitive treatment for whatever ails a given patient and consequently we are on uh, what turns out to be as we, we hope it's a, a bridge to a place of recovery it turns out it may be one of these things we call a bridge to nowhere um, and and then how do we the, the current term as we listen to the news is is off ramp how do we move away from the, a bridge to nowhere to something that is uh, an acceptable um, pathway going forward now, a word on intensive care unit patients, for Pete's sake, no one makes an appointment to be in the intensive care unit, right? No one ever expected to be there. Um, I was uh, uh, ill here about 30 years ago, wound up in an intensive care unit. It was a, a, a shaking experience, um, hope never to return. Um, and, um, uh, and it also turns out for this patient in particular uh, that we're talking about today, this hypothetical patient, that the physiologic responses to acute and severe illness are actually many times more devastating to the body than the actual illness itself. She starts out with pneumonia, which is an infection in the lungs. She becomes septic. And there's um, a, a pathway, what we call a cytokine release uh, pathway. We see it very dramatically in COVID. We see it less dramatically, but every bit is lethal. In, um, in other situations like pneumonia, uh, sepsis, pancreatitis, other entities, which causes multiple system failure, hypotension, um, uh, inflammation of the lungs, inflammation of the kidneys. And so uh, none of this stuff is, is directly related to the pneumonia, but only indirectly mediated by the body's physiologic defense mechanisms. So it's very, it's paradoxical. In the middle of all this, as I'm sure you are aware, um, in American culture today, there is a sense that, you know, we're entitled to good health. We are, we we will survive uh, illness, uh, and and we're entitled to absolute um, uh, autonomy, and 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 we respect autonomy. But we're going to take autonomy in context going forward here. So the questions uh, that we begin to think through as um, as a healthcare to medical team, what do we what what is uh, what's the right path forward for any given patient? Do we keep everything going and wait, hope for this patient to recover? I I, I honestly believe that this patient uh, cannot recover from this. Do we wait for God to intervene with a miracle? These are questions that the families uh, many times are asking. Do we allow natural death and we shift to shift from a curative to a, a, a comfort intent? What would the patient want? What does the family want? What is the right thing to do? Is there a right thing to do? And how do we make decisions that everybody can live with and also look back on 10 years down the pike? That includes us. We want to make decisions that, that we can look back on and know that we did right by the patient. And finally, when is, when is continuing <laughs> these life sustaining treatments. What is this thing called futility? I can look at the case as I presented it to, to, the, uh, uh, to the day of this lady's uh, multiple system failure and say, you know what, I do believe that care is never futile, but, and, and providing care is never futile. But the, uh, the ongoing uh, technological support of this patient once we get onto a bridge that goes to nowhere, it is futile. 
may be considered futile. And we'll get down a little bit later into definitions of, of futility. So we take a step back now and look at some ethical principles. These are the, the, the classical uh, ethical principles. If you go to a board review course uh, in uh, any discipline in medicine, uh, these are taught as the so-called Georgetown mantra. Um, uh, Dr. Beecham, Dr. Childress, uh, uh, both used to be Georgetown. I think uh, one of them, I think Dr. Childress is at UVA now. Uh, these are what Ed Pellegrino called the prima facie principles, which represent the beneficence of the medical profession and uh, individual physicians. Uh, the autonomy of the patient and when and necessary in the intensive care unit, we, we turn to the surrogate decision makers, family decision makers. So the principles of autonomy uh, go hand in hand with uh, surrogacy. And coming down to the end of life decision is very important to keep these two uh, front and center. Non-maleficence, uh, we, we do not intend harm and at a larger level, we uh, have a lot of efforts and programs in place in hospitals nowadays, all hospitals are required by the Joint Commission to uh, minimize, uh, mitigate um, complications, errors. Uh, and so the non-maleficence is an active process and then distributive justice. Four principles. Um, and we live and breathe these, but there's more to this than for principles, really. And first, there are some there are some challenges and problems with these principles. These are these are uh, a secular. Um, it's a secular construct. Uh, it was uh, brought together by Beecham and Childress as a, um, a matter of finding those principles that most people on the planet could agree on. Except really, it's American construct, uh, and uh, and these things are not quite so clear cut in in non-American uh, cultures. And these are these are good principles. There's nothing wrong with them, but they have to be taken in context and with um, with acknowledgement of their limits. Autonomy these days. There's some interesting work uh, by Robert Bella and uh, and Carter Sneed out of uh, Notre Dame on this thing called expressive individualism. I'm sure many of you have heard this and, and we certainly see it. Expressive individualism is, is the, uh, what, what Sneed would call the, the anthropology that has gotten us to a place of abortion and, uh, and assisted death. Uh, well, it manifests itself also in, in day-to-day -day, uh, encounters with patients and their surrogates. For example, at the, at the end of life uh, decisions, um, that, that take an interesting turn. We'll, we'll get there in just a few minutes. Beneficence can take of the healthcare profession, the beneficent physician, you know, historically back in my dad's day and before that, it was uh, the, the phenotype of paternalism. It's uh, the doctor will make a decision and, and tell the patient and family you know, what it's gonna be. Well, nowadays also beneficence and true beneficence, the, the, the the, uh, the, the good and well-intentioned uh, shepherding of, of uh, a patient by a physician. Well, this of course is a casualty, can be a casualty of, uh, of, of cancel culture and, 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 and postmodern jettisoning of, of authority, authority figures and whatnot. Perhaps most importantly, and, uh, and this is borne out in literature, excuse me, that goes back 30 years, there is a long, long-standing history of uh, race and and gender disparities in how we practice medicine. Uh, this was articulated in a, uh, a Council of Ethical and Judicial Affairs paper in the Journal of the AMA here in 1990, looking at several subspecialties that they found upon a review that that um, non-white patients were treated differently than white patients. And that particular uh, paper, which is still out there and available, it's, its historical value is, is that it, it's lamentable testimony that so little has been done to mitigate these disparities until the tragedy of George Floyd put a, a fresh energy behind 
um, mitigating these things. But I believe that our beneficence and our autonomy uh, is, is conditioned and tainted by these unconscious and involuntary disparities that have been built into the system over many, many decades and centuries. So consequently, there are limits to uh, the, 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 the ethical principles. Uh, they are not perfect. They are, as uh, one group of ethicists would say, these are, this is morality invented as opposed to morality discovered. Well, virtue is a uh, is what Edmund Pellegrino, of course, you know, here at Georgetown, I can't give a lecture on anything without talking about Ed Pellegrino. Um, I, I just think he is a remarkable thinker, uh, regarded by many as the, the father of modern medical ethics. Um, and his he is a virtue. He was a virtue ethicist. He he passed away here about uh, nine years ago. But he believes that virtue is that which uh, uh, shepherds forward these uh, four principles. Virtue remains the inescapable reality in moral transactions. The moral effectiveness of, let's say, for example, those four principles still turns on the disposition and character traits of our fellow men and women. Okay, how important is that? This is preeminently true in medical ethics, where the vulnerability and dependence of the sick person force him or her to trust not just in her rights, autonomy, et cetera, but in the kind of person the physician is. So I'll take it a step further here and say that behind the virtue um, is this assertion. Uh, well, I, before I get there, I'll say this is more Ed Pellegrino that that medicine itself as a beneficent profession has its own morality. Uh, this is a, a Thomistic uh, thinking at its best. Medicine exists because being sick and being healed are universal human experiences, not because society has created medicine as a practice. Rather than a social construct, the nature of medicine, its internal goods and virtues are defined by the ends of medicine and therefore ontologically internal from the outset. Goes on to say that medicine possesses authority, moral authority, and it's there that moral authority is incumbent upon practitioners, regardless of whether they like it or not, or what other doctors think about it. This authority arises from an objective order of morality that transcends the self-defined goals of a profession. Um, I commend to you. Um, the Pellegrino Reader, The Philosophy of Medicine Reborn, uh, edited by Tris Engelhardt and Fabrice Jodorand out of Notre Dame. Behind all of this, then, uh, is the clinical encounter. And uh, Pellegrino says the clinical medicine is the locus ethicus whose end, the end of medicine, the telos of medicine, is the right and good healing action and decision. Even when there is not recovery from illness forthcoming. There is still a right and good healing action and decision, which is to be made by physicians. Now in our, in our uh, Christian and Catholic identity, of course, we believe that uh, it all goes back to the absolute and abiding sacredness of human life. This is written by David Gushy in his uh, a book from about uh, nine years ago, Human Life is Sacred. This means that God has consecrated each and every human being without exception. And in all circumstances, no matter how old and firm, demented, as a unique, incalculably precious being of elevated status and dignity, through God's revelation in scripture and incarnation in Christ, God has declared and demonstrated the sacred worth of human beings and will hold us accountable for responding appropriately. So in this brief excursus into uh, ethics uh, on the surface of it, there are the principles. Underneath the principles are, uh, are the, the virtue of the physician and the internal morality of medicine. And all of this, of course, is grounded in the absolute sacredness of every human life, which we 
affirm and reaffirm in any way we can. Okay, to return then, we're gonna meet with this family and we're gonna go and talk about what we call goals of care. So as we shift from a curative intent, we, if we go into these meetings many times, not knowing how the outcome is gonna be, the majority of times I'll tell you that in working with a patient who is not going to survive as we have in this uh, lady before us, both the family and the physicians, the nurses all come to an understanding simultaneously and independently. Now, this ain't going anywhere. Uh, she can't survive this. So what are we gonna do next? And many times they know what is on the horizon. They know the decisions that have to be made. But when we go into the meetings, certain number of times, we, we don't know what the family or the surrogates may be thinking. So there are a couple of outcomes here. Uh, either we're going to shift to a palliative, in, palliative intent. Uh, we, we put limits on interventions, we, or we may de-escalate uh, medications or certain settings. And we ultimately may come to a place of what we call compassionate extubation or withdrawal of um, the ventilator, withdrawal of life support. On the other hand, the outcome of this meeting may be that we will advise the family that this is a situation that's not going anywhere. Uh, we wanna ensure the patient is not suffering. We want to not prolong or complicate the dying process. But the family in turn will meet that with, nope, we, we're gonna wait, we're gonna wait for a miracle. Uh, we want you to escalate, do everything, do CPR, do what you have to do, do not give up. Uh, and there's no limits and no endpoint to this. Now, we, we respect that and, um, uh, and we're gonna come back to that here uh, shortly. But in the meantime, I wanna talk a little bit about this family meeting and how do we do family meetings? This is a fair amount of literature on this and a, and a whole lot of um, um, my doing this uh, that I'm gonna share with you, what I think is some ways to do it and, and some ways that I think um, doctors don't do it right. Most of these meetings go smoothly. Uh, I do think it is critical if the family says, I don't want any medical students there. I, you know, they, they have a right to that. Sometimes I'll honor that, but I really want students there because they're not gonna learn this stuff any younger. I want residents, I want the nurses uh, in the meeting, the nurse who's caring for the patient that day needs to be in that meeting. Um, we, the nurses have, an absolutely invaluable perspective. They, you know, doctors, us dumb doctors, we go in there you know, a couple of times a day. Nurses are there around the clock in a couple of different shifts. So they see it all, they hear it all. Um, and, and they hear what the families have to say at the bedside. Now, much of this, just as a, a side note, I'm taking this from a pre-COVID uh, experience. And, uh, and obviously things have changed. Many of the meetings are, are held online now. We know the family is in a tsunami mode and everywhere from anywhere on this spectrum from they're stoic or they're openly hostile. And many times today in America, we're seeing a real uptick in the amount of uh, workplace violence and that includes violence uh, directed against physicians and hospitals. So I'll have security present and I will when possible sit next to the door. We can't, find half advanced directives. If patients have them, we can't, family can't find them. They never bring them. And, uh, and consequently, uh, uh, we're left cobbling together what the family can help us uh, with in terms of the patient's uh, preferences. We have decisions to make. Is the patient gonna be a full code, DNR, partial code? Are we going to withdraw life-sustaining treatments? Go to what we call comfort measures only. And all of these have to be taken and decisions made in the setting of, is this a terminal illness or is this a, an acute illness in an otherwise healthy patient or is it acute illness complicating a terminal illness? So the decisions are guided by the setting many times. There's also these other things in the mix, these intangibles, the, uh, you know, what's the dynamic that we've, the, the, uh, 
the family has with the physician. More importantly, I show up on a Monday morning and, and I'm going to be inheriting the, the previous physician's uh, encounters with this family. I'm hoping they all went well. Who is in charge in this family? We have to identify that person. It's always good to know that in the waiting room, families talk to each other. They have uh, likes and dislikes, and, and they can develop a little bit of a, uh, a group mentality. And then, of course, on the physician side, we have physicians who are, as I say, communicationally challenged. And we have some um, uh, repair to do uh, when we, we come on board. There's always cultural and linguistic considerations, and it's always good to have and required actually to have a sponsored, hospital sponsored interpreter when, when necessary. 10 most important needs of families. This is well articulated, supported in the literature. They wanna be, be with the patient, be helpful, be informed. They wanna know what's being done and why. They wanna make sure the patient is comfortable and they need to be comforted in themselves. They need to be able to ventilate their emotions and be assured that their decisions were right. We have comfort carts. We put it outside the patient's room with uh, nutritional uh, support, uh, uh, muffins, soft drinks, juices, whatever. So we're trying to take care of their physical needs, those who are present. I teach this to my house staff. This begins, the physician has to have a sound understanding, comprehensive understanding of the situation with the patient. And one of the first things that I do is to get, a, uh, get an understanding of the, what's the family's understanding of the situation. I will ask them, frankly, what, what do you understand about your loved one's condition? Start from there. I try to get their, an understanding of their values, their goals, um, we have to, I have to tell my team, you know, sit down, don't stand up at these meetings, turn off your pager, silence your iPhone. It's impossible for my daughters to do that, but you know, that's what we have to do. And we have to process this family's anger appropriately. Where is it coming from? Um, and is it directed at us? Is it directed at the situation? Is it directed at a complication that got the patient here? Many families bring to the table ancient family strife. And we have to remember that we are not the uh, therapists here. We are the shepherds of this process. We can't resolve family conflict in these meetings. We are to be beneficent guides. We're not supposed to list options. We need to tell which option we think is right and why. Be open to the family's input. Try to engage families in their own way of making decisions. Be a part of that. Uh, while also guiding according to our level of expertise. Um, and I do believe that there is a, is there a book I'm going to share with you here in a minute that, that goes through the, the, the uh, authority of expertise that we bring to the table. We want to honor the family's hopes, but also prepare them for the, uh, depending on the clinical trajectory of the patient, to the possibility, likelihood, eminence of death. And I always tell, teach our house staff to just sit back and remember this is your family sitting there, your loved one who is being taken care of. Family meetings, you know, traditionally the doctors talk way too much. Um, turns out that family satisfaction, these, these things called family satisfaction surveys are uh, Satisfaction is improved the more the family is allowed to speak. It's good to go into the room as a medical team, say a few things, and then even actually be quiet, listen to what the family has to say. That's hard for us to do. And it's appropriate to, uh, to invite their input, uh, uh, particularly their spiritual needs. I will ask families, what is their faith tradition? How can we be supportive? Family satisfaction. I hate this term family satisfaction. I'm there to take care of the patient the best I know how. I'm not there to satisfy someone. I want to do right by the patient. And it's hard to imagine satisfaction at an end of life crisis, but, uh, but there are these uh, surveys out there. And it turns out that many families are actually unburdened in some ways by the physician bringing up the option of compassionate extubation and withdrawal of advanced life support. 
many times they'll say, well, we don't know. We never had the conversation with grandma. Um, we don't know what she wants, uh, to which say, I say, you know, you know, we, we're not going to wake her up. It wouldn't be, wouldn't be a good idea. It's going to cause suffering. We, we, we don't know if that's, you know, would bring her to a level of consciousness that the patient could understand the situation. And I'll tell families, I'll say, you know, I think you need to go to the conversation of life. You know this patient better than I do and longer. Uh, and you've loved her for a long time. I think you know what she wants. We just have to think through it. So principles of withdrawing life support. What we want to do here is, is withdraw in a sequence life-sustaining treatments that are no longer desired or do not provide comfort. Um, withdrawing life support or withholding it is uh, morally equivalent. Um, we do not engage in anything that intentionally hasten, hastens death. Um, this is, should be considered, it's not really yet, it should be considered as a medical procedure with all the safety surrounding, um, safety uh, programs surrounding any procedure we do. Uh, and very important when circumstances justify withholding one life-sustaining treatment, we should probably be withholding all life-sustaining treatments. More on that momentarily. As I say, this is another critical care procedure. We want to emphasize to the family and actually to ourselves, sometimes there's a little drift, that we are going to take, this is intensive care, we're going to ride this out. We're going to take intensive care of your loved one in her final hours. We are to communicate with and prepare the family. Uh, I, uh, palliative care is there at the bedside. We want to optimize the venue uh, and to explain to them, and whether we do this at the bedside or in a conference room, uh, is there's a lot of factors that go into that. Uh, but we want to explain to them what this may look like and, uh, and how things may unfold. You want to avoid uh, medical jargon uh, that might be confusing. We're going to discontinue anything that's not directly palliative. You know, sometimes there's a question of continued blood transfusions or antibiotics. And there's evolving literature on this that suggests that no, if we're shifting to comfort measures, antibiotics do not provide that. Uh, blood products don't provide that. Um, and, and consequently, again, if we're going to withhold life support, we're probably going to withhold or withdraw all things interventional, including antibiotics and, and blood transfusions. We talk about uh, how we want to discontinue ventilator support. We individualize the pharmacology, but the, it is a lot safer with protocolized regimens of narcotics and benzodiazepines. The doctrine of the double effect um, with protocolized interventions for, um, for narcotics, we, we really believe we can do this uh, without intentionally hastening uh, death. In the palliative care literature, there's evidence that, that we actually um, prolong life the way we do this, um, uh, a more comfortable life. Uh, but, um, uh, but protocolization and palliative care has, been, has really revolutionized how we do this. We take out any lines or catheters that were not needed for uh, comfort only. Now, I'll say a few words on futility. Um, but before I do, I'll just you know pause and say that that's a lot of material. Uh, if, if anybody in my profession ever gets comfortable doing this stuff, it's probably time to, to move on. I always have to pause and, and you know, sit and think, you know, am I doing this the right way? Am I, I, I believe I'm accountable before God. And this is not an easy situation. It's not a normal, natural situation. Um, and so reflection, both for uh, the doctors and the nurses uh, before and after the fact. And in many cases, after we have uh, been through the withdrawal of life support process, there is, uh, it is desirable to sit down a day or two later and to do a debrief uh, and to hear what 
the nurses have to say and how they've uh, experienced this. We're not, um, we're not emotionally uh, mute as it were in, in the middle of all these things. But the patient, if in many situations today, we can look at a patient and say, you know what, this is a futile case. This is not going forward. The patient is inexorably dying. And the continued, um, uh, continued life support is prolonging and complicating the dying process. I'm seeing a chat here uh, that reminds me, pastoral care, fundamentally important. I, um, I mentioned this, uh, that, uh, uh, that the faith tradition, what's the faith tradition of the family or the patient? We bring that up early on, and um, uh, we we get pastoral care er, in at the earliest uh, nanosecond, and they are there throughout. Certainly, if there's a cardiac arrest anywhere in the hospital, in this hospital, there's a there's a chaplain on call 24/7, and they are there from the get go. I'm seeing chats come up. I apologize for not getting to them. So what I'm going to do is is uh, move forward and then put your questions in the question box and someone will hopefully uh, broker those uh, for me. To declare somebody, to declare a case to be futile, a, a uh, interventions to be futile, we don't want to do a quality of life because my quality of life assessment on a patient is not gonna be the same as the patient's. Rather, the concept of futility uh, has to employ evidence-based models and practical wisdom and experience. Futility itself is a difficult concept. There's terms of futility, definitions for it, physiological, me medical ineffectiveness. Uh, there are physiologic scoring systems like the Apache scoring system, which will indicate a high probability of death, pro high probability of death, or the qualitative concepts of a certain treatment is either proportionate or disproportionate. There's also process-oriented approaches to futility. Uh, the, the Texas Advanced Directive Act, for one, and a multi-organizational position statement more recently indicating a seven-step process for conflict resolution. So it moves from a futile situation to conflict resolution. Now, at, at Georgetown, we have um, uh, adopted a definitional approach, which I will uh, share with you momentarily. Uh, but this is the seven step process from the multi organizational group where they call in an independent expert resolution uh, consultant. Uh, we notify the surrogates, we get a second medical opinion, we pull together a committee, God help us, a committee. And we offer surrogates the option of having a patient transferred to another hospital. <clears throat> we inform the surrogates of their opportunity for a so-called extramural appeal. That is, you can go to court. And then the process, the decision of the process is implemented. Those who have worked with these processes, <clears throat> for, for example, in, in uh, Texas, I'm, I have not uh, used these. I'm told they are cumbersome. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and stress-laden. Consequently, we've come to a, a place where we really believe that physicians do have the authority to say, you know what, there is an intervention here that is biomedically futile. It ain't gonna work. It's gonna cause harm and suffering, and therefore we're, we're not gonna offer it. Not meant to be heavy-handed, but this is articulated by Carlin and Tollison. The physician does have the authority of expertise regarding this patient's uh, care. And we have authority with respect to what interventions we will offer and what we're not gonna offer. And this authority should not be abused or disrespected uh, by the physician. We can't step out of our bounds, but the families and surrogates uh, uh, need to receive what we have to say when it is authoritative and, and grounded in beneficence. So Curlin and Tollison have endorsed what they call the way of medicine, which is a doctor's professional commitments and expertise do give him or her authority to decide what she is willing to do within the framework of her profession as a healer. 
And so finally, this is the, <coughs> the definition of, of biomedical futility that we are currently using. And it is a clinical judgment that in a patient's current circumstances, a certain intervention is neither physiologic possible for a certain intervention to achieve its goals, or it will be continually and repeatedly needed. The example is CPR. We're not gonna do CPR in this way. We're not just not gonna do it. It's gonna be necessary repeatedly. It's gonna cause harm and it's not medically indicated. And we say that a judgment that an intervention has a reasonable possibility of biomedical success, but the quality of the patient's life would be for, this is not futility. That's a value judgment, that's paternalism. So I'm gonna wrap it up here with just a comment that we are at a crossroads in medicine. Uh, on the one hand, there is a culture of expressive individualism and radical autonomy, radical surrogacy, um, and a provider of services uh, model of medicine. On the other hand, there is the, the virtue as being the shepherd of the principles of the internal morality of medicine, the authority of medicine, the way of medicine, which is uh, leads to a right and good healing action and is brought about by the authoritative expertise of the medical profession. In summary, I'll just say that the, there's principle, yes. <clears throat> the founding principle is that we are created in God's image, that human life is sacred, that the authority and virtue of the physician are paramount and that the end of medicine is the right and good healing action of the physician at the bedside of this patient. Back to the quote that I started with. Um, on that day, men will gather in great mead halls and sing of the day when physicians like giants walk the earth. So, there was a day, and that day is still here, I think, when physicians can be seen as an authoritative, important, compassionate presence in society. I hope that day won't pass and we have to look back on it uh, and sing in, in great meat halls. Share with you two books. One is a Pellegrino book on the right, and the other is Carlin and Tollefson's book on the left, The Way of Medicine. Uh, both out of uh, Notre Dame University Press. Uh, th these are good reads. Um, and, and finally, we'll conclude on Holy Week with, um, with this image from uh, Rembrandt. Okay, uh, I pushed up against the hour here, and I'm going to turn it back over to the team, and I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Uh, just we have time for a couple quick questions from uh, the participants. Um, one of the first questions was, um, with with this case study that you have, um, wouldn't wouldn't it have been better in some ways to to not admit this patient to the ICU at all, but rather go towards hospice? Um, undoubtedly, and uh, and I'm of course speaking from from the perspective of someone who is on the receiving end. Uh, I walk in on a given day and uh, you wouldn't believe who's been admitted to the intensive care unit. Uh, utterly improbable uh, patients who have no chance of survival. Um, we're not yet at a point in medicine today where uh, we can vet patients ahead of time. It gets into a, uh, an, until you know the patient well, uh, how do you, how can you say a case, a, a intervention in such an intensive care unit is going to be uh, futile? I agree with you. This patient should have been um, uh, ideally uh, by her uh, private physician on a good day and a stable condition to have some advanced directives to say, you know, you're likely to get pneumonia. You're likely to get, what, what about when these things happen? I agree. Um, however, in my line of work, God has brought them to my doorstep and I will take care of them accordingly. Okay. In terms of those family meetings, a number of people have commented on the fact that um, 
uh, it doesn't seem that there are social workers or chaplains are, are, are normally included in those meetings. Uh, should they be? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Um, now, usually the first meeting is, is you know, we have you know, a, a string of meetings with a given family. The first meeting in general is uh, a clinical update and it has a, an urgency and a time limit um, that we need to get the people who are caring for the patient. As things settle out in the days ahead, um, you know, I want the chaplain there. I want the social worker there. One way or the other, the social worker is our liaison with hospice. Uh, I oversee case management and social work here at Georgetown. There is no harder working group. Uh, there is no more thankless work than that which they do. We are hamstrung by not having enough of them for them to be available uh, uh, at all the meetings we really need them at. And we need them. Uh, by the time we get to decisions like this, we need palliative, we need social work, we need, uh, you know, if it's necessary, we need patient uh, advocacy. The more disciplines present, until that point where it gets to be crowd control, um, we, uh, uh, we want all input from all people. And even if they can't be at the meeting, we need their voice there. Thank you. Um, two other quick questions, and then we'll have to end. Um, somebody wondered whether, um, how can, can you talk more specifically about how beneficence is impacted by cancel culture? <laughs> okay, that's, um, that's me probably up late one night just being sort of fed up with, with culture and I just, it, it came out on the slide. So yeah, uh, and, and enjoy it. This is a, um, uh, I'm not sure that, that if I go into a, um, a forum with my patient's family. And I had this experience not too many days ago with a very high, with, well, with a, with, with a patient um, who was uh, a prominent figure in, in the, the area. Uh, and I mentioned that, you know, we're gonna do some things and my usual line is, these are the things we're gonna do which are gonna help the patient, we're gonna do them. And here are some things that are not gonna help the patient and that can be harmful to the patient. And so we're not going to do them. And it's Washington DC, of course. And so someone predictably said, well, who are you to say what's gonna help the patient? Uh, and well, here's what I say, that's, that's my beneficence being spoken. And it's a little bit of cancel culture out there to say, and who are you to say that? In other words, the presumption is that the physician really, you know, you're, you're here as a provider of services. I want a certain product, you are here to provide it. This is what we call the provider of services model, a la uh, Carlin and Tollefson. Their contention is the way of medicine, which is what I like to think that I, I tried to say is no, we're not going to be a provider of services. We're going to offer what is the right and good healing action. Thank you. Uh, the last question is, um, in terms of, of the training of medical students and residents, um, we, we have a culture in which uh, it's, it's less and less likely, I, I suppose, that they have an understanding of that for the virtue of a physician and the idea that there are uh, there is a way of, of practicing medicine that is virtuous. How does their formation work at these days? I mean, how is that being addressed in terms of, of incoming medical residents and medical students? Okay, so uh, in a Catholic facility like Georgetown, it's being addressed from the minute they walk in the door. Uh, we have the Pellegrino Center, which uh, latches on uh, to all students during their first and second years. And we have a, a growing program of, of, of continuing that uh, educational intervention into the clinical years. Um, sadly, uh, in, in many medical schools across the country, you know, anything faith-based is, um, is really moved off campus. Uh, uh, there, there's, there, there's um, you know, the Christian Medical Association has uh, had a lot of experience with, with folks whose um, faith-based beneficence uh, the, the virtue ethic 
is very much in the middle of this postmodern um, uh, disdain, if you will, for things of the faith and specifically things of, of Jesus followers. Um, so in secular medical schools, it's a problem. Um, uh, and, and even in a, a, a faithful medical school, you know, there's influences outside the classroom. Uh, I hear it when I teach ethics. Uh, there is, you know, we get to do it here because we're Catholic. Um, but is there a, a, an undercurrent of disdain? Uh, yeah, I pick up on that. I do. Thank you very much for your time. We appreciate uh, the, the, the extended uh, discussion we've had really on, on how to make these decisions in the ICU. Um, all right, well, happy to follow up with anybody who wants to communicate and I thank you all. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to just remind everybody here that um, the Catholic Health Association does have uh, an ethics app available to uh, those of you who are members of CHA. Uh, so you can download it uh, at that uh, link uh, through uh, the, the website of, of the Catholic Health Association. And the other thing I'd like to remind you of is that uh, the upcoming sessions uh, 11 and 12 uh, will be happening uh, in the next two months on May 11th and June 15th. Uh, and then we will begin our second series of this webinar series uh, in July, uh, continuing on the first Wednesday of each month. So we invite you to uh, continue to uh, come and, and join us for these conversations, which we think have been very valuable discussions. Um, Thank you everybody for participating today. Uh, before you log out, we'd ask you to please uh, to complete the quick survey that we have. Uh, so we use it to uh, get feedback from you all and to prepare for future presentations. Uh, so I thank you very much for attending. Uh, and on behalf of the Catholic Health Association, uh, again, thank you for participating. The, the recording of this event will be emailed to you. Again, please take a moment to complete the survey. Today's program is copyright 2022 by the Catholic Health Association with all rights reserved. This concludes today's program. Thank you very much and have a great day. Bye.